So for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm not a comedian, as you can tell, but uh, my name is Moses Camacho. I am the senior pastor of South Hills Church. You've walked into one of our many locations, uh, meaning we have multiple locations, uh, seven of them here in Southern California, uh, three out of state, Ohio, Virginia, and Idaho. And then we also have a global campus um, in Kenya that we get to partner with and work through in our uh, global communities. And so you've walked into uh, our Costa Mesa location, and this is where I'm at every week. And so thank you for being here. And so we're excited to uh, be able to continue in this message and the series that we're in. It's called The Thing Behind the Thing. We just got started with this last week. So if you are new, you are not behind. You just got started, and we uh, you can go to our Church Center app and download, uh, and I'm sorry, and you go to our Church Center app to watch last week's message if you want to get caught up with what the opening message was about. But we are getting started with uh, this actual process of why is it we do the things we do? Um, what is, you know, inside of our hearts and what is inside of our, our stories and our brains and our minds and our experiences that kind of drive us to making the decisions we make? Some of them are decisions we want to make. And then sometimes we make decisions that we really don't want to make. And then we find ourselves into like, why did I just make those decisions? It's not really what I wanted to do, but I find myself in those situations. And so what is that thing behind the thing? And so today uh, we're going to dive into one of the questions, which is what we do in our moments when we don't feel safe or what we do in that drive when, uh, when we are wondering if we are safe. And so uh, for those of you who have met uh, my wife, Jill, uh, I have a lot of stories of her and the decisions she makes when she doesn't feel safe. And so I'm going to go ahead and share some of those stories with you today. Uh, she's not here, so I can pick on her all I want. And so uh, so she's, uh, so she's one of the things that I remember in our early time of being married, uh, we, we used to live in this place called Canyon Lake, which is about an hour from here down that Menifee Marietta area. And we had a house that was kind of like a flag lot, they call it, which means it's not on the street with all the other houses. You got to kind of go up this driveway and it's tucked way back, you know, behind everyone. And so it was kind of like in this pit, you know, and it was a, and it was a cool home. It was our first home. And, uh, and we, you know, we, we really liked our home, but the neighborhood we lived in was against streetlights because he wanted to see the stars at night, which is really cool. Right. Um, so the, you know, the beauty of that is you could see the stars. The scary part of that is there's no lights. It's really, really dark. And so if you are afraid of the dark or if you have any mysteries inside of your head that of what happens in the dark and you're tucked away from the rest of the neighborhood on this flag lot in this deep hole, there's a lot of things that run through your head. So she was in college and uh, she was... Um, Finishing up her school, and she comes home. She had a night class that got done like at 10 o'clock at night. So by the time she got home, it was like a little after 11. And so I was home. I was in. I was in. I was in the bedroom, and I was watching TV. And I knew it was going to be time for her to come home. And so uh, when that time came, I was like noticing she wasn't coming in. She wasn't coming in. She wasn't coming in. I'm like, what the heck? So I go to check my phone to see like what's going on, and she calls me. And I'm like, oh, shoot, like something happened. Like it's about an hour drive from there to here. And I'm like, I can pick up the phone. I'm like, hey, did you break down? And she's like, no. And I'm like, did you get an accident? And she's like, no. And I'm like, so then where are you? <laughs> and she's like, I'm in the driveway. And I'm like, okay, well, why? Why don't you just come in? She's like, I can't. And I'm like, all right, hold on. So then I walk through outside the bedroom. I walk to the garage. I open up the garage, and I, there's the car, and there she is sitting in the car. So then I walk up to the car, and I open the door. She gets out of the car. She walks right in, and she goes into the, into the, into the house. So I was so confused, and I'm just like, this is so weird. Like, you know how, like, when you date someone, and you think, like, you know them, and then all of a sudden you get married, and you're wondering, like, oh, shoot, this is the moment where you start to realize how weird somebody really is, right? And so I close the door, close the garage, and I go into the house, and I'm like, what was that all about? And she's like, I was paralyzed. I'm like, what do you mean you were paralyzed? She's like, I couldn't get out of the car. I'm like, why? And she's like, I had a million scenarios ran through my head as I drove home from school today. I was terrified thinking something was going to happen as soon as I got out of the car. I wasn't sure if somebody was hiding underneath the car, someone was going to slit my, my, the back of my heels. Um, I wasn't going to be able to run. I wasn't going to be able to, and I'm like, where did you get all this? I'm like, what movie did you see? And she's like, I don't even know. 
I don't even know. And it's and it hasn't and it, it it's not as bad anymore to the point where she's paralyzed, but it still runs through her head. This this weekend, she her and the, her and the boys are actually in Arizona. The boys have a, are playing baseball in Arizona. Don't know why they plan baseball in Arizona in the summertime, 110 degrees. It's a terrible idea, but that's where they're at. Boys are getting ready for college and all that stuff, and so. Um, I came home last night so I can be here all, uh, with you guys. And so as I got home last night, she ch- texted me. She said, hey, she's like, did you make it home? And I said, yeah. I said, I just walked into the door. She's like, oh, good. She's like, I don't have to sell the house. I don't have to get a different job. The boys can continue to go to, continue to, go to school. They don't, have to, they don't have to quit their sports. And they don't have to get jobs to help me with groceries. And I'm just like, are you kidding me right now? Like, what is this? She's like, well, this is what runs through my head when I'm not sh- certain of what's happening in someone's life that I love. And so this is a great <laughs> illustration for me to lead into today's message because she struggles with, is she safe? Does she feel safe? Are the people in her life are they safe? And when she's when the question isn't answered with a yes, she's wondering, she's going crazy in her mind, coming up with all kinds of different scenarios because that question has not been answered with a yes. Once it's answered with a yes, like, okay, I'm home, I'm safe, then all the crazy thinking goes away. And she's like, okay, you know, everything's good, everything's normal. But in reality, you may not be that extreme. You may not be that extreme. But in reality, many of us, do go into this different uh, different way of thinking when we feel like our safety is in danger or when we feel that someone that we love, their safety is in danger. I come from a, a large family. My Both of my parents are Hispanic, which by nature, that's just a large family. But this is, this is crazy. Both of my mom and dad have 10 siblings on each side. So I have 20 aunts and uncles, all right? So you can imagine what a family gathering was. And... and it, you may not know this part, but Hispanics tend to be exaggerative. And so whenever my cousin was running around a park or a neighborhood, there would be an ant around them chasing them around because they were worried for their safety, that they were going to die, they were going to get hit, they were going to fall. And so there was this just constant fear of something happening to someone's loved one. Now, how those things happen are different for everyone. They could be very innocent things that happen in our life such as financial uh, challenges, causes you know some fears of where are we going to get our next meal from? Are we going to have enough? Uh, or maybe there are some drastic things that happen in our life, like abuse, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse. And then at that point now, there's, safe, there's questions of safety of can we trust people in our lives? So no matter where your bringing, upbringing is, whether it happened, you know, whether it was a great upbringing and there's very minimal safety questions or whether it was a rough upbringing bringing, and there's a lot of uh, safety questions, there's quite a few things that we're constantly asking ourselves. Will we be okay? Am I protected? Is everyone in life against me? Will I be able to survive? These are questions that go on through our heads and our hearts. And so the safety question is this. It's not a matter of like, is this ridiculous? Why do you think this way? It could be a a, a question that needs to be answered in order for growth to happen inside of your head, inside of your heart, and more importantly, in your relationship with God and your relationship with others. So, so So here's what I want you to know. What if safety environment isn't a luxury? What if safety environment isn't a luxury? What if it's a fundamental growth and a fundamental need for growth? What if it's something that's so important that we need to have this question answered with a yes so that we can have growth in our relationship with God and we can have growth in our relationship with those around us? What if this question was something that was driving your decisions that either created distance in your relationship with God and distance in your relationship with others? And if you are, you wouldn't be alone. There's a, a, a boy in the Bible, and his name was Joseph. And he had a lot of things happen in his life that should not happen to a boy. He had a lot of things happen in his life that really should not be a part of someone's story. But unfortunately, it was. He was one of 13. He wasn't Hispanic, but he was one of 13. Okay? He probably could have been, you know, based off of the amount of siblings he had. But he was one of 13. He wasn't the youngest. He was the second youngest. He had, mul- he had like over 10 half-brothers, one full brother, and a half-sister. And he was 
I would say from based off of what the Bible has to say, he was really liked by his father. And what I mean by that, he was given special treatment. He was given um, special clothing. He was given less work than his older brothers. So by nature, when a parent favors a child, especially the baby of the family or the youngest of the family, there tends to be jealousy in the older brothers. And in these moments, in the jealousy of the older brothers, the brothers started to look at Joseph and started to be jealous of him and started to despise him, they started to not like him and not want him around. And then Joseph didn't really help himself out because Joseph kind of went around not realizing that his brothers didn't like him. <laughs> and whether he chose to ignore it or whether he chose to like just you know accept it, but he walked around as if he had no idea his brothers didn't like him. He kind of flaunted his robe as it was no big deal. It's like, I just have a better robe than all of you. It is what it is. Learn to deal with it. His brothers would go out and do work and, and do some really physical labor, and he didn't have to do it. He would kind of just sit there and watch and think like, hey, this is, this is I'm the chosen one. I am the one that doesn't have to do what you're doing. So he obviously did not help himself out. And then the Bible says that there was a moment where he actually came back and reported, gave, gave a bad report about his brothers to his father. Some would call it he was snitching on his brothers. And from my understanding, snitches get stitches. <laughs> Maybe not in the Bible times, but some way, somehow, it still wasn't liked. It still wasn't, it still wasn't something that was very, you know, favorable. And so here's the story. I want you guys to understand because we're going to focus on this Joseph story. And in this Joseph story, his father sent him out to go check on his brothers because his brothers were out watching cattle, doing, you know, doing what they were told to do by his father. So Genesis chapter 37, verses 17 through 19, it says this. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dotham. It was a different city than what they were told to be at. Now Joseph's brothers saw him from a distance. So here's Joseph coming up to them. His brothers see him from a distance. And before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. So now his brothers are like, hey, we are far from where my father is. We are far from where our land is. Here comes Joseph. And they hated him. They despised him. They were jealous of him. So then they come together and they start thinking about, let's get rid of this guy once and for all. No more walking around with his fancy robe. No more him standing there with a cup of coffee watching us work. No more him going back and giving bad reports to dad. Let's get rid of this guy once and for all. So some would say that was kind of extreme behavior, right? Like that's jealousy at the highest level of acting out in an unhealthy way. Like obviously jealousy isn't good. And when we all experience jealousy, our reaction to jealousy should not be let's get rid of someone, right? Well, there should be a different way of approaching that. But as you learned last week, when we don't have our biggest needs answered in a way that we want them answered, like if I'm struggling with not feeling wanted and I'm unhealthy in that and not my relationship with God, I'm going to act out in a way that I shouldn't act out and do things I shouldn't do if I'm not in a healthy place when I don't feel wanted. So his brothers were acting out in an unhealthy way. So they plotted to kill him. Not the response that probably they should have been thinking about. They said to one another, here he comes, the master of dreams. And so Genesis chapter 37, verse 21 through 4 says, When Reuben heard this, Reuben was one of the older brothers, he rescued Joseph from their hands, saying, let's not take his life. Reuben continued, don't shed blood. Throw him into this cistern that is here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this so he can rescue Joseph from the rescue Joseph from them and take him back to his father. So Reuben, his older brother, actually was trying to make decisions in a healthy place, saying, "Hey, listen, I think it's a little overreacting to act, to kill our brother. Like that, let's not put that on us. That's a that's that's just not something we want to carry for the rest of our lives. That's an extreme reaction. Why don't we just throw him into this cistern? The cistern is like a big, huge, deep water hole." And the Bible says that actually they was, it was dry, so they decided, Reuben decided, Let's, let me talk my brothers into throwing them in there, and then we'll all leave, and then when they're gone, I'll come back and rescue him. So Reuben was really the only one out of the brothers that was at a healthier place. Maybe not healthy, but at least healthier. 
like getting thrown into a cistern is still getting thrown into a cistern. You know, however, you know, however you go, however you want to slice that pie. So then when Joseph reached his brothers, they stripped him from his tunic. That was a fancy tunic that his brother had, that his father had given him. That was nicer than all the other tunics. So they stripped him from his tunic, the special tunic that he wore. Then they took him and threw him into the cistern. Kind of a rough reaction to jealousy. Kind of an extreme behavior to feeling jealous towards someone else. So what was happening here? What was happening in Joseph's brothers? What was happening in their heart that they felt like this was the right decisions to make? Decisions that they weren't going to regret. Decisions that they were going to be proud of. There was something inside of them that was feeling like they weren't wanted. They did not feel the love that they felt that Joseph had from his brother. So in a reaction, they made poor decisions. They made poor decisions in a place where they didn't feel like a core need inside of them was happening. They felt different and felt excluded and felt left out and felt uh, isolated from the love of their father like Joseph had. And so then Genesis chapter 37, verse 26 through 28 says, Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Now before I go any further... You might be thinking like, oh, finally, someone decided to talk some sense into the rest of them. It's like, okay, what do we profit by killing our brother and shed his blood, right? And then he comes up with the, the other idea that's like, okay, you were on the right track, and then you just took another turn into the wrong track again. It says, come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. Ishmaelites were the descendants of Ishmael, which was uh, the line of Abraham. So whenever they say Ishmaelites, it's kind of like the family heritage. It's like saying, hey, let's sell them to the Camachos, or hey, let's sell them to the Smith. Or hey, let's so it would so it basically they're they were identifying a family line. It says, come, let's sell them to the Ishmaelites, but let's not lay a hand on him. For after all, he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. Now, this is what's interesting to me. His brother's like, Yeah, you're right, let's not kill him. Maybe that was extreme. Yeah, maybe let's not leave him inside of a dark hole and die inside of this dark hole. Maybe that was extreme. But you know what? Here's what's better. Let's just sell him to slavery. <laughs> That's the better decision. Now, some may say, if I was to sell one of my siblings to slavery, yes, it's better than killing them, and yes, it's better than, to be, better than leaving them out in the wilderness to be eaten by wild animals, but it's probably still not a healthy decision. My parents probably would not be very happy if they said, hey, where is your sister? And I said, well, I decided to make some money and I sold her to slavery, mom and dad. Like, it's just not going to go well, right? It's still not healthy decision making, okay? So then so, uh, brother, his brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants passed by Joseph's brothers, they pulled him out of the cistern and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. The Ishmaelites then took Joseph to Egypt. Let me just kind of dig deep into what could have possibly been happening here in Joseph's heart. The Bible does say that the brothers describe Joseph's uh, state of place where he was crying out for mercy. He was pleading to not, for them to not do this to him. Uh, his brothers hated him. His brothers ultimately tried to kill him. They attacked him. They stripped him from his clothing they threw him down a dark hole to be left, to be killed by wild animals. And then later they sold him to slavery with the mindset that they were never going to see him again. So as Joseph, being a young boy, teenage years, experiencing all this from his family, his family did this to him. The place of safety the place of security, the place where we normally or we should feel that we can trust and have people in our life that wouldn't be, not be out to hurt us. It was his very own family that did this to him. So there was a creation that happened inside of Joseph of like, am I safe? Am I safe at all? Like I was stripped, I was beaten, I was, th I was 
thrown into a hole. I just, I was left to be dead. Then like I was, th- and then I was sold for slavery. Like I just don't, I wouldn't be, I would be struggling with feeling safe. What is my life going to look like? Am I ever going to see my parents again? Am I ever going to see my siblings again? Am I ever going to see my friends again? Am I ever going to see my home again? When there's an emotional and physical need for safety goes unmet, there's a primal question that goes unanswered. And this may or may not be your primal question, but at the end of the day, we all go through the questions of, do we feel safe? And when that question is answered with a yes, you feel safe, you make the healthiest decisions. You make decisions of not wanting to hurt people, sell people, or throw people into a hole. You make decisions of wanting to have conversations like a normal human being. But when, you're, when that question is being answered with a no or a maybe, you go into what is called the scramble, which means you're in a place in your heart and your mind where you're not making the best decisions where you're making decisions that ultimately you may regret. And the scramble looks something like this. You see the bottom line where the question is a no and then the top of the question is a yes. If the question is answered with a no, in the middle you create this chaotic space where you go wild trying to get that question answered with a yes because you want to feel safe. You want to be in a place where your loved ones are safe, where you are safe. And then until that question is answered with a yes, you will run around wild trying to figure out how to bring peace into that place. And this is something that Joseph struggled with. But there was something that Joseph figured out that whenever his question was going to be answered with a no, he had a formula that I would call, a place that ultimately he could figure how to feel safe and how to make best decisions even in chaotic moments. And so let's dig dig deep into this, right? So if we are feeling in the place of scramble, normally when we're in a place of scramble, we're not making the best decisions. For me, whenever I get into a place of the scramble, I try to tend into, I, I, I lean into control. Control, worst case scenarios. I try to, I try to, you know, control what I can. I try to um, take over whatever positions or p- decisions I can make. Uh, normally, I don't have a say in my home, so I go control my car and I clean it like crazy because I, it's the one thing I can control. Um, or I plan for the future and I, I lay out my calendar and I plan out, you know, the rest of the week and the rest of the month and the rest of the year and the rest of the next five years, depending on how chaotic I feel, right? And so, so Joseph ultimately shows some of this. And in the gifting to it, in uh, Genesis chapter 41, verse 46 to 49, it says, Now Joseph was 30 years old when he began serving Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Joseph was commissioned by Pharaoh and was in charge of all the land of Egypt. During the seven years of abundance, the land produced large bountiful harvest. Joseph collected all the excess food. Joseph collected all the excess food in the land of Egypt during the seven years and stored it in the cities. In every city, he put the food gathered from the fields around it. Joseph stored up a vast amount of grain, like the sand of the sea. That's a lot. Until he stopped measuring it because it was impossible to measure. So you can see Joseph in his learning how to deal with life and not feeling unsafe, he started to become a person who can plan and control and think ahead. And this doesn't just show up in control issues. It also shows up in relationship issues. Genesis chapter 42, verse 7 and 8 says, When Joseph saw that his brothers, he recognized them. This is a time now where his brothers had come and they, they had ran out of food and they wanted to, they wanted to buy food from, from him, not realizing that he was in charge. So when Joseph saw his brothers had recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger to them and spoke to them harshly, he asked, where do you come from? They answered, from the land of Canaan, to buy grain for food. Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. In this moment, now they're older. Joseph does, is, is, is older. He's now been trusted by Pharaoh to run his land. Um, he's, been, he's basically the, the strongest man in charge other than Pharaoh. The rest of the people have, have run out of resources. Now they're coming to him. And the brothers see him, but don't recognize him. Joseph does recognize him but he's hesitant towards jumping back into a relationship. 
Why would he be hesitant? Maybe because his brothers tried to kill him? Maybe because his brothers stripped him? Maybe because his brothers left him to be dead? Maybe because his brothers sold him to be a slave? Why would, be, why would he be hesitant to jump him back into a relationship? So how do you think Joseph responds? How would you respond? Put yourself in Joseph's shoes. Your family, your siblings beat you, throw you into a hole to be left dead, sell you to slavery while you're crying and pleading for mercy, and they just watch you go. And years go by, and Joseph's story, you need to read this. It is, it didn't, he didn't just get sold into slavery and become Pharaoh's right-hand man. He got sold into slavery, worked his way into becoming in, you know, uh, a person in Pharaoh's palace, then gets put into prison for doing nothing wrong. Then he can interpret dreams because God gave him that gift, and he gets back into Pharaoh's palace. Then he gets trusted with Pharaoh's kingdom because he was eight, God allowed him to interpret dreams and a dream that Pharaoh had. So he, had, he didn't just arrive from slavery to being Pharaoh's right-hand man. He went through a lot of pain and a lot of loneliness, and a lot of torture before he arrived to that place. And here he is. His brothers are standing in front of him. How would you react? Stitches. <laughs> That's right. That would be a natural human sinful reaction. <laughs> but what did Joseph do? And here is how Joseph managed to have healthy decision-making, even in the most chaotic moments. This is how Joseph managed to line up his heart and his decision-making in what is the healthiest way of making decisions because of his relationship with God. Because God was the loudest voice in his life. Because he had conversations with God and God would speak to him and Joseph would listen. And whenever we have an emptiness in our heart and a confusion in our mind and a chaotic emotions and feelings and thoughts, the voice that's going to get you through that every single time is the voice of God. It's the voice of God speaking into your life and reminding you that you are safe, that you are wanted, that you are loved. And God speaking into your life, reminding you who you are and how much worth you have. And so Genesis chapter 45, verses 5 through 8 says, Now do not be upset and do not be angry with yourselves because you sold me here. This is Joseph's response to his brothers. Like, hey guys, don't be upset. Don't be angry with yourselves. I know you sold me to slavery. It says, for God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. This is Joseph saying, God sent me ahead of you. God planned for me to be in this place to preserve not just my life, but your life as well. For these past two years, there has been famine in the land for the five more years. And five more years, it will be there. Well, uh, it says, there will be neither pl uh, plowing nor harvesting. God sent me ahead of you to preserve you on earth and to save your lives by the uh, by great deliverance. So now it is not with uh, it is not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me advisor of, to Pharaoh, Lord over all the household, and the ruler over land of Egypt. So when 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 Joseph could have responded with revenge, and that probably would be the most common response. And when we feel in a chaotic state of place where we're not, our hearts are not aligned with God, God's voice is not the loudest voice in our hearts, when we are feeling emotional, we're feeling chaotic, most of us probably would have responded in a human nature, which is a brokenness inside of us, that would want to respond in a sinful way, which is revenge. But at the end of the day, we see that Joseph did not respond in revenge because of God's voice being the loudest voice in his life. 
and him having a perspective and a relationship with God that was able to speak into the needs he had when he felt unwanted, when he felt unsafe, when he felt unloved. God's voice walked him through all those things. And that's exactly what God's voice would do to us when we feel in a chaotic state, in a chaotic state, when we're feeling broken, when we're feeling not wanted, when we're feeling not safe. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20 says, as for you, you meant to harm me, but God intended it for a good purpose so he could preserve the lives of many people as you can see the day. So Joseph had come to an understand that God had a greater purpose for his life than what his brothers could have possibly ever imagined. Joseph came to understand that this was bigger than what had he had experienced. Joseph came to understand that regardless of the pain and the suffering and the loneliness that he went through, God was able to use that for a bigger purpose, for a greater message, for more peace, for more direction, for more, for more life, and to be able to preserve other lives. So somehow, some way, Joseph arrived to a place of saying, okay, I feel lost, I feel broken, I feel alone, but God... You are with me. Your voice is in my head. Your voice is in my heart. My relationship with you is getting me through this brokenness that I'm going through. And then it continues in Genesis chapter 50, verse uh, 15 through 21. It says, Then Joseph's brothers saw that their family was dead. Now we're at a place where Joseph's father had died, and now his brothers are still struggling with finding health and peace and a relationship with God and trusting God. They're still, they're still dealing with guilt and shame. And so now his brother, uh, this is what happens, uh, this is what his brother says. What if Joseph bears a grudge and wants to repay us in full? And it says, for all the harm that we did to him. So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father gave these instructions before he died. Tell Joseph this, please forgive the sin of your brothers and the wrongs that they did when they treated you so badly. Now, please forgive the sin of their servants and their, uh, the servants of the God of your father. When the message, when this message was reported to him, Joseph wept. Then his brothers also came and threw themselves down before him. They said, here we are. We are your slaves. So here you see that Joseph's brothers are still not at a place where they're leaning into God's voice. They're trusting God's heart. They're, they're believing that God is the loudest, voice in the loudest voice in their lives. They're still suffering with shame and guilt. And once again, Joseph responds from a place of health. And he says, but Joseph answered them, don't be afraid. I am in the place of God. It says, am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant to harm me, but God intended it for good purpose so that he could preserve the lives of many people as you can see this day. So now don't be afraid. I will provide you. I will provide for you and your little children. Then he consoled them and spoke kindly to them. And so sure enough, through this over and over and over, when Joseph could have responded in hurt and pain and anger and frustration, when Joseph could have responded in revenge, he leaned in on his relationship with God. He leaned in on the voice of God. He leaned, he leaned in in hearing from God over and over and over. When things did not make sense, when things were not fair, when things were broken, when things were, were, were against him, he relied on his relationship with God. And just recently, I've shared the same advice with my kids. My boys, I have, like I said, I have three boys. Two of them are in high school. They're getting ready to start their sophomore year. They're in a place now where they're having to make some decisions that are going to be life-changing. Their high school career is four years, and one's down the road. One's already gone. They have three years left. They're, they love sports, and they've done sports their entire life, and now they're making decisions of, what sports can they continue in? What sports do they need to let go? Are they at the right place where they can excel at the place of what they want to do? And they're looking to mom and dad to help them with those decisions. And you know what I tell them? I tell them this. The decision is yours. It's time for you to make the decision. But I will tell you this. Whatever decision you make, you are going to find yourself questioning your decision. You're going to find yourself in tough times with your decision. You're going to find yourself, did I make the right decision? And the only thing that's going to get you through all of those moments is your relationship with God. So I tell them, before you make a decision, have a conversation with God. 
because you should not be making this decision alone. And I'm going to share with you the same advice that I share with my kids and the same advice that I share with myself. Your relationship with God, your conversations with God are going to be what gets you through every difficult place in your life. If you are here and you are living, you know life is not easy. <laughs> you know life is hard. You know sometimes there's life that there's joy in life and there's pain in life. Because we live in a broken world and a broken world is full of sin. This is not heaven. This is a world that is broken. Sin entered into this world and we have to live in the brokenness until we get to be the, in the place where we are with our heavenly father. But until then, it's our relationship with God that will get you through difficult times. It's the voice of hearing God's voice in your life, answering those questions, you are loved, you are wanted, you are safe, and letting his voice drive you through every one of those circumstances. And when you can't hear his voice, get around those who love God so they can help you through that moment. Community at the end of the day is what's going to keep you connected into your relationship with God and keeping you moving in your relationship with God. So when you are tempted, when you are tempted to be overly cautious, remind yourself that leveraging community to move out of your comfort zone is how you grow. And how do you get into community? Well, you're in community right now, but this is Rose. The other community is a circle. And we have found that you grow more in circles than you do in rows. And how do you get into a circle? This thing called Rooted. <laughs> this thing called Rooted is starting up. And you can get into a circle in this Rooted group and have a community that's going to be walking alongside of you and making sure that God's voice is the loudest voice in your life. So that no matter what you go through in life, God's voice can be the loudest voice in your life and you can react in decisions that are the healthiest decisions because God's voice is the loudest voice in your life. South Hills Church, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for watching our service online. Whether you're watching it for the first time or you're watching it again because you enjoyed the service so much from the weekend, I'd like to take a moment and dive into our giving. Every week we give people the opportunity to give back and give to the local church so that God can continue to bless your lives and bless your finances. Here at South Hills, we believe that everything comes from God. We believe that he's the one that chose us and brought us into this world, gave us our gifts and talents and abilities. And I just want you to know that when we give, we are giving back what God has already given to us. If you've ever seen any of our envelopes at a South Hills campus, you'll see on there that it says, every week at South Hills, your generosity is giving people the opportunity to live a better story. And there's a scripture on there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 that says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want to encourage you today to click down below and set up your giving, whether it's for the first time or whether you're doing reoccurring giving. We have four ways to give here at South Hills. One, you can do it in person at any of our campuses through an envelope. Or two, you can actually text any amount that you would like to, to 84321. And the third way is to download our Church Center app. I encourage you to do this one because the Church Center app gives you opportunity to stay connected with our church and your campuses. It's a great tool and resource for you to know what's going on. And the fourth way to give is to give online. You can go to southhills.org slash give, and you can set up your giving there. Whether you're a guest of our church or whether you are a member of our church, whether you simply just like to watch our services, I encourage you to trust God with your finances so that he can bless and anoint your finances and you can be trusting God in this journey of living life to the fullest. I love you and thank you for watching our online service today.